the stories behind the standards. This is the BSI Education Podcast with Matthew Childs, Alan Sellers, and Cindy Parokil. Today's episode is on standards and potholes. My name is Matthew Childs, and the aim of this podcast is to bring you the stories behind the standards. You're probably wondering what that musical intro was all about. Well, the music is The Beatles' A Day in the Life, the final track from their Sgt Pepper's album, released in 1967, and considered by many to be their finest song. In that song, John Lennon sings the lyrics, Don't panic, I'm not going to attempt to sing it myself. I read the news today, oh boy, 4,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. And though the holes are rather small, they had to count them all. And now they know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. The story goes that Lennon and McCartney wrote those lyrics after reading an article published in the Daily Mail newspaper in the January of 1967 about, well, potholes in Blackburn, Lancashire. So, today's episode is indeed about potholes, but it's more specifically about standards and road surfacing. The standard BS10947 for spray injection patching in particular, and how new technologies can be incorporated into standards. We'll hear from two standards makers, Ian Walsh and Dominic Gardner, members of the BSI committee with responsibility for road surfacing and producing BS10947, and also from our violinist and standards development manager, Gavin Jones. Now, people get passionate about potholes. According to the Federation of Small Businesses, in 2019, councils in the UK received over 700,000 complaints about them. And you only get a true sense of what a pain a pothole road can be when you use one that doesn't have any. And that's true even if you drive a car, no matter how good modern suspension systems are but it's most true when you are cycling. Now, if you've ever had the privilege and pleasure to cycle on French roads that have been beautifully resurfaced by the local authority because the Tour de France route came through their department the previous year, then you'll know what I mean. The sensation of rubber on clean and smooth tarmac is an absolute joy. The opposite is an absolute pain. There's nothing really worse than cycling on a road with pitted tarmac having to take quick evasive manoeuvres to avoid potholes of all sizes and facing the ever-present danger of being forced to move into oncoming traffic. On one of my regular cycling routes, there's a stretch of road that passes a major teaching hospital. For the most part, the quality of the road is fine, but for a 200 metre stretch, it's absolutely awful and it's been that way for 15 years. It's completely infuriating. See, I told you people get passionate about potholes. Before we let those passions rise too high, Matthew, let's pause for a moment to consider what exactly do we mean by potholes? It's easy to assume that potholes are formed due to roads being poorly maintained, but that's not usually the case. There are many factors that can cause potholes. The following stages demonstrate how a combination of weather and wear and tear are the major causes of potholes on roads. So let's start with water. Water seeps in through cracks in the road surface, collecting underneath. Over time, water continues to saturate the road base underneath, softening it. When water freezes, it expands and forces up the road surface. Then changes in temperature. The cycle of freezing temperatures and thawing causes further cracks to appear. Potholes also form during the summer months, where the foundations of the road have deteriorated. And finally, traffic. Stress from traffic causes potholes in isolated locations. Weight of traffic breaks up road surface to form a pothole, and wear from traffic expands the hole. In the intervening 54 years since Lennon and McCartney were inspired by that newspaper headline to write the lyrics to A Day in the Life, it would appear that nothing much has changed. Potholes are still with us, and local and national headlines are still being written about them. (music) 
Is this the worst pothole in York? York Press, 22nd of March. Calls to resurface Rodburn Road plagued by potholes. Swindon Advertiser, 13th of March. Huge pothole in Tarperley leads to road closure. Cheshire Live, 21st of March. Road with 70 potholes, worse than Mars. BBC News, 23rd of February. It's easy to poke fun at potholes when you hear headlines like these. But potholes do present a serious policy issue. As I said earlier, in 2019, UK councils received over 700,000 complaints about them. And the insurance industry estimates that UK drivers spend £4 billion a year on vehicle repairs due to pothole damage. They pose a danger to life too. Between 2014 and 2019, more than 250 cyclists have been killed or seriously injured in crashes caused by potholes. And of course, there's a financial cost of repair to consider too. The Asphalt Industry Alliance's Alarm Survey provides an annual snapshot of the condition of the local road network in England and Wales. Now in its 26th year, the 2021 survey found that the number of potholes filled over the past year by local authorities was just under 1.7 million, an average of 10,025 per local authority, at an average cost of £43 for a planned fill and £69 for a reactive fill. Now, in part three of the episode, we'll hear more from our resident violinist and standards development manager, Gavin Jones, about road surface standards generally. In part two, we'll hear from managing director of Velocity UK Limited and standards maker, Dominic Gardner, about BS10947 and the impact it's having on solving the pothole problem. But in this first part, we hear from Professor Ian Walsh, director and senior consultant in highway pavements and materials for Road Consultants Limited and for the past 25 years, Chair of BSI Committee B510-2 for surface treatments. I started by asking Ian about the technology behind spray injection patching. Uh, Historically, the way that you would treat a pothole, which is why they cost about £70 a pothole, is that you'd have a truck would go out there with a team of uh, three guys uh, and... Uh, in in the in the truck, they'd have uh, a, a batch of hot tarmac. They would probably have uh, a jackhammer, a compressor, uh, a load of kit, including extensive traffic management. And they'd go out and they would dig away around the pothole to remove all the uh, on worn out material, all the material that was failing. Uh, and that would that would take them best part of an hour or more. Uh, meanwhile, of course, there's traffic disruption and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> you have the eternal phrase, there has to be a better way. And uh, this uh, spray injection patching uh, was of, uh, came from Australia, uh, a better a better way. And uh, I worked years ago for Kent County Council, and the man from Australia brought his kit to me in Kent and said, what do you think about this? And I said, well, I think if we do this, that, and the other, it will be excellent. So he did this, that, and the other, and it was excellent. So the system now is that this device blasts the pothole with a stream of hot compressed air at high pressure. And that blasts out of the hole all the loose material just lifts it out. It can't go very far, but there's an issue there that we addressed to ensure that it didn't cause any damage, the bits didn't fly through windows and things. Uh, So you blast out the hole so you've got a clean, warm, dry hole of sand material. And then they turn on the bitumen into that hot air stream, and that squirts bitumen down into the hole and primes it. Uh, like uh, like a primer, paint primer. And then they turn on the aggregate into the bitumen stream and you make an in-situ tarmac into the hole, which is compacted by the, real, the, the actual velocity with which it hits the deck, compacts it into layers into the hole so that you get a compacted uh, tarmac in a clean, hot, dry void 
And then if necessary, you can put a little plate vibrator on the top to finish it off, and you've got a pothole patched. And it takes about five minutes, which is an enormous saving in traffic management, in traffic disruption, and the quality of that product has shown it to be, for most local authority roads, very good. And the standard BS10947 then, it describes that process. Absolutely. But more importantly, what it does do is to say this product has been tested out. It has been installed in accordance with this process. And it's achieved the following performance in service. So people know what it will do. For example, it says when traffic runs over the patch, it will not rot and deform and shove and come out. It will stay there and the quality of the finished surface will be as good as the finished surface (coughs) surrounding it. So there's an absolute performance requirement written in there so that customers have faith in the product. So it's it's called a performance-related spec, and the the system is described in general terms so that uh, somebody isn't told that the air pressure should be at at, uh, a certain air pressure, that the aggregate has got to be uh, of a certain substance, and so on and so forth. The constituents, it just says they've got to have them, but it doesn't define what they have to have. They do a trial, they install it, they check the performance in service, and then they have a method statement, which means every day and every way into the future, they do it in your road in the same way as they did it in the demonstration. And it's all audited by uh, an ISO 9001 company to make sure that they do retain their uh, quality and it's supplemented so that all the auditors do the work in a constant way in something called National Highway Sector Scheme 13. There's actually 30 sector schemes for the installation of almost everything in the highway. This is number 13, which covers surface dressing, surface treatments of all kinds, including spray injection patching. So for, if a local authority was using this approach then on the, on the highways, do they, they don't require any, any new equipment at all? Well, they've got to have the kit. So there's two ways, three ways they can have the kit. They can have the kit because they can buy it from the kit manufacturer. There are a number of them, okay? That's the – it's a truck uh, which contains the aggregate, contains the bitumen, contains the presser for the compressed air, and it contains the pipe that feeds it all into the hole. It's a, it's a piece of kit. They can either buy one for themselves or they can hire one from a hire company or more usually, I have to say, they go to a contractor who has one of these things and they say to him, go around our town fixing potholes. These are the roads that we've coloured on our with on our plan with felt tip pen. Uh, and these are the roads that Go forth, young man, and search for potholes and fill them in. And they did a plan for a town here in Kent that they estimated by uh, conventional ways it would take three weeks to do those potholes. And the company came back after two days and said, well, we don't know. What do you want us to do now? And they couldn't believe it. They went around and they said, Blow me, he has. So uh, that's that's the way it operates. Um, in uh, Scotland, they prefer in Northern Ireland. They've been buying the machines um, uh, and then operating them themselves. The the issue about buying the machine and operating it for itself is a little bit like you doing your own paving in your garden. You wouldn't bother going to an external company to check that you're doing it right, would you? I mean, there's no need to. You're doing it yourself. Um, uh, So hiring another company to do it really ensures that if it goes wrong, they'll fix it. Whereas if you do something yourself and it goes wrong, you've got to fix it yourself. But as long as they're well-trained and the company that sells them does the training, 
and everything, then whichever way it, the, it goes forward, it produces a good job if it complies with the standard. Are you a postgraduate studying at a UK university? Do you have a research idea or project that involves standards in some way? Well, if so, BSI Student Research Program can help. The way it works is simple. We gain valuable information about an area of interest to our standards work, while you can benefit from mentorship to support your project and the chance to gain knowledge and exposure that may increase your future employability. To find out more about the program, including case studies of previously supported projects and how to apply, visit bsigroup.com forward slash education. We continue our pothole story with Dominic Gardner, Managing Director of Velocity UK Limited, Standards Maker, and like Ian, also a member of BSI Committee B5102 for surface treatments. Uh, Velocity UK Limited was incorporated way back in 1997, um, introducing this spray injection patching technology into the UK, machines which can quickly repair a road and drive away and repair lots and lots of defects. Um, it was probably quite revolutionary at the time that it was introduced in 97. Um, since then, we've grown a fleet of machines which we operate for local authorities throughout the UK. And we manufacture equipment that, that's built in our factory, both for our own use, for sale within the UK and for export all around the world. Um, so we've been doing that now for, for over 20 years. And how did you and the company become involved in standards making and why, why is it important for you? We are a member of the Road Surface Treatments Association, which is a, an organisation representing all of various different types of, of road surface treatment. And on, on those committees, we, we, we've written codes of practice and Velocity have been heavily involved in that process over the years. Um, but codes of practice are very good and they're talked about within the industry, but there isn't really that step out to put them in front of local authorities and the people who really use this process. Um, so when I was introduced to, to BSI back in 2018 with the idea of producing a British standard on spray injection patching, we were very keen in order to be able to publicize the process and really set like a, a benchmark specification that, that, that everybody could use. From your perspective, why is BS10947 important? BS10947 is the standard for spray injection patching for highways and other paved areas, and it is, is effectively a specification. The repair process was actually referenced in British Standard 434 Part 2 back in 2006. And just a little one-liner from that standard saying that velocity patching is a cost-effective alternative to traditional patching methods, that one reference carried quite a lot of weight. And uh, we certainly used it when we were, were talking to local authorities. So we were very keen to actually write at the standard around this process in its own right, effectively just to set a benchmark, to set a level of expectation for, for what local authorities can expect to achieve from this process um, and to raise its profile just so that it's, the, the process can be more widely used on the UK road network. So I'm a local authority then. Uh, I'm presented with this standard. How, how would I and other, other local authorities and other organisations use it? The standard is very good in that it, it provides an introduction in, into what the spray injection patching process is. So it, it defines the, the fact that materials are going to be sprayed onto a road surface through a delivery hose, which is very good to, to set that benchmark. It talks about the different uses of the process, so both for emergency works and for permanent repairs to the road network. And then it, it lays out the, the process of manufacture of, of the spray injection patching product, which is actually sprayed into the road. So it, it's, it's very clear and, and concise in terms of providing that explanation as to how it all works. But I think most importantly for, for a local authority, it actually tells you what you can expect from that process in terms of performance and lifespan. And, it, and it's really that that should give local authorities confidence to use the process. And also, it makes them able to, to hold contractors to account to make sure that the way that they're applying this process uh, conforms to the standard. 
Now, on the on the podcast, uh, Dominic, in previous podcasts, we've talked about standards being uh, solutions to problems. So I'm interested to find out how has BS10947 helped improve our route, our roads so far? Um, so far, it's been referenced in several tenders that have been published by local authorities when they've been um, trying to find solutions to, to problems on their road network. Um, the spray injection patching process is a very fast and cost-effective way to permanently repair an awful lot of defects in a short space of time um, so that the standard has been incorporated into these tenders, effectively enabling the local authority to, to put together a specification for a process that they may not be experts in themselves, um, which, which is very good. And also it creates almost like a level playing field that each of the local authorities is actually asking for the same thing. So creating a, a a level of performance really across the country that everybody can expect. And what about the sort of the long-term ambitions for the standard? Well, the standard will be reviewed, uh, I think on either an annual or a biannual basis. Um, the, the standard is discussed at regular meetings within the Road Surface Treatments Association. And all of the contractors who are applying this process have got a chance to, to comment and to contribute and as technology develops in time, uh, the standard will will reflect those changes to technology um, and, and those new ideas which are being brought in. And putting your sort of uh, wider standards makers hat on here as a committee member, what other standards could be developed, do you think, to help address the UK's pothole problem? Well, it's interesting that the Asphalt Industry Alliance has just published its annual alarm survey and they talk about the, the fact that local authority budgets for highway maintenance increased marginally last year. However, the, the talk about the, the, the use of preventative road surface treatments is actually falling. I think that that's where there's potentially an opportunity for, for new standards to look at treatments to road surfaces, which are going to make roads last longer and incorporating new technologies, which we're, we're reading about all of the time. I think it would just give local authorities more competence to use these new treatments if if they were part of British standards. Now, obviously, you, you're a standards maker. Obviously, you run a company involved in uh, dealing with potholes and road surfaces. Uh, I just wonder what you know how you deal as, as a standards maker and someone working in the business. How you deal with that potential conflict of interest when you're developing standards. That's a very good question. Um, obviously, I wear my my velocity hat with pride. But on this committee, I was representing the industry, which of which there are three or four other providers of, of this service. And the, the key task was to try and draft a standard and a specification that enables local authorities to have competence in uh, the uniformity of the product that they're, they're looking to buy. But also, it wasn't just written around, written around my technology and my company. Um, it had to be written in a way that was open enough that other members of the industry could also comply with this standard in order to give it that level of credibility uh, that we're all striving for so that this process can be used more widely on the UK road network. So Dominic, at the, at the start of this podcast, I started talking about uh, Lennon and McCartney and the day in the life, uh, their song of the Sergeant Pepper's album, which of course references 4,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. I'm just wondering, as a, as a company, have you ever filled any potholes in Blackburn? Yes, we have. Uh, we, we undertook a, a programme of work in Blackburn, Lancashire last year. And I'm pleased to say that we've got a programme of work to start for them again this year. And I would anticipate that by the time we finish this year's programme, we might even have filled 4,000 holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. Here's me again with a quick reminder that for more information on BSI Education, go to bsigroup.com forward slash education. This link and others on the themes raised in this episode can be found in the episode notes. Do please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and share us on social media using the hashtag BSI EdPod. And if you have any comments or questions about this episode or previous episodes or ideas for future episodes, then do please get in touch at education at bsigroup.com. We really welcome your feedback. To complete our story, let's hear from resident violinist and standards development manager at BSI, Gavin Jones. I asked Gavin to put standard BS10947 into context for me within the wider work of BSI and the standards community on standards for road surfaces. Yeah, so the 
Road Materials portfolio um, is essentially owned by a, a committee called Technical Committee B510, which is Road Materials. Um, under that technical committee, there are seven subcommittees that work in various different areas, including surface treatments, bituminous products, and there are a total of around 400 standards in that space. Um, at the moment, we currently have uh, two standards in development, um, which is BS9228 on road recycling, and that describes methods for road and pavement materials that are processed in situ or used or that use recycling materials. So that's quite a forward-looking standard. Um, some of the benefits of that one, the content for industry really is it saves costs for local councils because it reduces the use of virgin materials, which are very expensive. Um, and also it halves the length of time that operatives are by the roadside. We also have the S8870, which is another brand new standard uh, that's on high friction surfacing and that one essentially makes that the, the high, sorry, high friction surfacing materials um, are used at high frequency collision points on the road. So, for example, in areas like on roundabouts or before traffic jams, you know, where you see different colored road materials, road surfaces, that is called a high friction surface. And the standard itself basically ensures equality for the producer of those materials to, to be used on the road. And that one's due to publish later this year. I just wonder, Gavin, given that uh, people travel more, you know, we are using the roads more than we've ever done. Is this, a, is this a growing portfolio of standards work for BSI and the wider standards community? So, yes, it, it is. Um, I've been managing the portfolio for quite a while now, five years, and it is by far. So I, I manage um, other committee, other committees in unrelated areas, such as gas installations. Um, and chimneys, believe it or not. Um, but the most, yeah, the, the busiest portfolio that I manage is 510. And when I say busiest, I mean the one with the, the most standards being developed, the, the most, the greatest number of new standards being developed, as well as the greatest number of revisions. That's certainly my, for my portfolio. I have a bit of a reputation with the um, editorial team as a result as well. <laughs> Now, Gavin, we've talked uh, a lot of this podcast about uh, BS ten nine four seven. Could you uh, could you just tell me, you know, how important a standard is this within within the current portfolio? Um, so, ten nine four seven was published a few years ago, and it, it's a brand new standard, and it's it, it's actually very typical of the portfolio that I manage, and that it's a very niche. Um, it, it covers a very niche product area. In fact, a lot of the standards, especially the, the more traditional product standards, in other words, standards that specify how a product is made and how it's applied, um, they they tend to be very niche areas. Um, and this one, it, it's not a, I won't say it's a big standard, but it's a step in the right direction for looking at the pothole issue in the UK, which is itself a growing issue. The other standards in the portfolio that I mentioned are all interconnected um, with a standardization, I'll call it an ecosystem. So we have various other organizations, predominantly Highways England, who have a huge standardization portfolio. And that, that's a portfolio that's been in development and uses and cites a lot of the standards in the B510 road materials portfolio. And there's, there's constant development. It, it's Road materials is a constantly developing technology. Um, there are various different factors, exogenous factors such as sustainability, which is why we're looking into road, road recycling and having that standard published as soon as we can. But yeah, it, it's a growing area. Road, you know, dr driving around in the car around any any area in the UK, we're going to see that there's roadworks. There are you know various problems that need to be resolved, and the portfolio. It, the main purpose of the portfolio is to help improve that situation. Now, you talked about um, the UK context there, and obviously this is a British standard at the moment. Obviously, potholes is a is a global problem. I just wonder, is there a route here for this to become uh, a European or an international standard at all? Um, yeah, that's something that we can look at, um, in fact. And it, it's not really, I mean, with the portfolio itself, something I'd, very important I didn't mention um, is that it's essentially what's called a mirror committee to a European, um, to the SEN European Normalization um, Committee in Europe, so uh, which is called SEN TC227 Road Materials. Now, that the route into Europe is basically 
uh, led by certainly from the BSI perspective, led led by the UK subcommittee uh, B five ten two on surface treatments, which would be that route to market. Now, Gavin, you've talked about the fact that. Uh, you've been five years on this particular portfolio. I'm always in, well, we're always interested in the podcast about uh, colleagues and our guest standards journeys. How did you get to this point? Yeah, so I, um, I'll, I'll go right back if you don't mind. Um, I studied English literature at university and graduated a little late. I was 25 and my first my first job interview, professional job interview, I'd say after I graduated was with a company called HarperCollins. Um, and in that interview, I was talking about one of my favorite subjects at the time, which is um, the poetry of Coleridge. And um, I was amazed to be sitting there at that age, talking to this big company about my love of poetry to get a job and a career. So somehow I got that job. Um, in the editorial department at Collins Education. And I was an editor basically for 10 to 15 years um, in various different roles in business to business publishing. And that found my way into BSI approximately seven years ago. Um, so I came the editorial route. Um, I was an editor for a year, year and a half, and then I got my job in the standards development team. But it, it's my, my work at BSI is founded on an um, Absolutely, and I'll, I'll say this, um, an absolute love of the people that I work with in terms of the committee membership. They are an incredibly inspiring bunch of people. Um, and you find as a standards development manager, everyone who works on, a, you know, volunteers on a committee, they all have some incredible degree of knowledge and experience, with, which will always be of interest to me. Gavin, we are talking from poetry to potholes how about that for a standard <laughs> journey yeah. well, from Coleridge to committees that's uh, that's absolutely brilliant <laughs> now Gavin we can't leave this conversation without talking about your wonderful violin playing so tell us more um that's my my other love um my other professional love really um I started playing the violin when I was four and a half talk, talking a long time ago but I've been playing for a very long time I had very different teachers and I'm I play professionally, so someone decides that they want to pay me to play. Um, so I must be at a relatively decent um, level to, to be able to do that. But I play classical music. Um, I play blues. I play jam. I play jam. Oh, sorry. I play uh, classical music, uh, blues, jazz, uh, rock, country, uh, a lot of folk music, a lot of Irish folk, all, all sorts of music um, at all sort of varying different levels, really. I, I can just about play a bit of Paganini. Um, but yeah, that, that's something I love doing. I, I run a small um, a small music business as well, which is basically a, a small ensemble outside of work. But obviously, we haven't had much work for the last year and a half. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a, another big love of mine outside my personal life. My, I suppose you call it performance history with the violin. I, I played on um, a track that reached number 39 in the charts a very long time ago. I'm not listed on the, the album, though, unfortunately, but um, it's called K. Sorry, the band is called K, and it's a song, I think it was called Mad World. I haven't listened to it for years. But there's a violin solo on it. And I, I've, done, um, I've done quite a lot of recording, which is, which is quite an interesting thing to have done, actually. Um, but also I played it. Um, the Royal Albert Hall when I was I was 18 I played a solo at the the youth um, the school's youth gig the last the last um, the last concert in that series so that that was quite an experience a piece by the Paul Williams um, the Symphony Number no. Five. Obviously, you played. Uh, a piece from a part of uh, Day in the Life uh, from the Beatles. I just wonder how long did that take you to learn that particular piece? Um, to be honest with you, Matthew, um, I, I just I played it by sight, really. Um, but when I'd, I'd seen it for about five minutes before I played it, it's a very very simple piece of music. Um, so yeah, it didn't take long to to learn how to play that one. <laughs> well, it was absolutely wonderful, and we're really grateful for you playing it for us. Uh, it's, it's, it's an, an honour being asked. Our thanks to Ian, Dominic and Gavin for speaking to us for this episode. And I think we should probably finish with some more of Gavin's wonderful violin playing. You have 
have been listening to an episode of the BSI Education Podcast. To find out more, visit bsigroup.com forward slash education. You just heard a stripped media production. <laughs>